Yeah, I still remember. I hadn't been here too awfully long, and Steve stopped by the house. And he was right in what he said, told me. I, I think I'd been mowing or something. He said, where's your ear protection? Well, I don't wear ear protection. Well, I do now, <laughs> thanks to Steve. So I was just checking to make sure he was wearing his safety glasses over his glasses because, you know, safety guys, we got to check on them sometimes. I, hey, I believe you, brother. I'm just checking on you <laughs> just because I love you. You know, that's the only reason to check on you, just because I love you. We are continuing our series. We've I've entitled it, We Are. It's just different, if you will, word pictures, wherein the Bible says, here's what we are as Christians. we got a couple more, two more in this series that I'd like to, 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 to do. There's more than that, but I think two more and we'll – Move on would be a, a good uh, way of doing it. I want you to ask yourself, or let me rephrase that. Have you ever just sat and wondered, why does God really care about me? Why, why, is, why does God take such an interest in me? Why does God care about what I do? But more importantly, why does God care about me and my daily activities? What happens in my life? You may have pondered those questions. You may not have them. In many ways, I hope you haven't, but you may have. And we ask ourselves that question, and I think, in part, at least, the answer to those questions is found in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. John wrote, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Notice what John says, we are, what? Children of God. Of God. What a great thought. What a great blessing that is when you stop and ponder the fact that we are part of God's family. When you think about Lanny Wolf's song, God's family, you think about the, the beauty of the family structure. And through the years, I've preached no telling how many sermons on the family and, and the importance of the family and the beauty of the family. But when you think of the church as a family and you think of being a child in God's family and being God's child, you realize really what a blessing it is. But what are some of the, the earmarks, if you will? Well, that's kind of how we've been attacking this series of lessons. What are some of the earmarks of, of being a child in the family? Well, in order to be a child in the family, you've got to enter into the family, right? We enter by how? Birth. In Romans chapter 6, Paul reminds us, we're buried with him by baptism to death. And we're buried with him by baptism to death that we become then, as Paul would write to the church of Corinth in his second epistle, new creatures or new creation. We become new. But that newness is seen in that we are born into the family of God. Galatians chapter 3, verse 27, reminds us of this as well. Now, here's the problem. A lot of folks say, well, you folks that have Church of Christ out on your sign, out front or in front of your door, you all, that's all you all preach, and that's all you all talk about. That's all you all center upon. I would hope that that would not be the case. But we understand the importance of such. We understand the, the, the importance of of being a child of God that requires us then to have that spiritual birth. That birth wherein we're baptized into Jesus Christ for the remission of our sins, and we rise up to walk a new creation. In John, the third chapter, as Jesus and Nicodemus are having a discussion, Nicodemus is having a difficult time understanding the concept. Understanding the idea, as Jesus presented, except man is born of the water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus says, how can a man enter into his mother's womb a second time? Nicodemus was looking at this idea of a new birth from the standpoint of physically. How, how in the world, and indeed, how in the world could a man enter into his mother's womb a second time? Can't do it. But Jesus said, except a man be born of the water and of the spirit. He cannot be a child of God. 
But when he is thus, and if you look at the, the opposite of that, the antithetical of that, then what is it? Well, if one is born of the water and one is born of the Spirit, what are they? Then they are part of God's kingdom. They are part of the family of God. It is important that we see this. And then you might say, well, how does that coincide with that wonderful passage in Ephesians chapter 1, where Paul, in talking about, as he does through the first 11 verses, he talks about the spiritual blessings that are found in Jesus Christ. How does that coincide with the idea there that we are adopted? There's a difference between adoption and being born into a family, correct? Sure. But when we are born in the family of God, God adopts us. We become then his children, we become his heirs, and we become his ch his children or his child. We become part of his family. And so we have to be, in order to be, if you will, in order to be part of God's family, to be a child of God's family, we have to understand we have to have a beginning. And that beginning is a birth. But then there is the family, what we're calling the, the family makeup. In other words, uh, all families are different in our culture in this day and age. Many of them are what's considered dysfunctional. Matter of fact, probably to some degree, all families are dysfunctional in some areas. But we understand that the ideal family, if you will, has a mother and a father and 2.5 children, right? I never. I think my parents looked at me as probably the point five, even though there was just two of us. But, but nevertheless, what does a family look like? What's it made up like? What does it look like? Well, we have God the Father, right? In Second Corinthians chapter six, Paul says, "Come out from among them, be separate," says the Lord, "and touch not that which is unclean." And then verse eighteen says, "That's verse seventeen. Verse eighteen says, and I'll be your father." out of the Old Testament. But Paul is applying the scriptures there to the church at Corinth. But notice text. I'll be your father. When we think of God, we should think of him as our father. Now, we can carry that imagery too far. We can carry it so far that those in the 70s, in the 1970s, you know, they, they wanted to, to call God daddy, and they wanted to, to have this loose relationship wherein that there was a kin, more of a kinship. This father, though, this idea of father, still puts within it a certain amount of respect, amount of if you will, of authority, of being the head. There's one God, Father, who's above all, through all, and in you all, right? Isn't that what Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 4, in those seven ones there? But God is seen as the Father. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means that he's the originator. That means that he's the provider. That means that he's the protector. That means that he is, if you will, the one that is in charge. He is sovereign or he is the one that is in full authority. God being our father allows us the opportunity to be his children. Now, we might look in our society today and we might say, you know, there are some houses where the children rule the family. There are some cases that's true, but God's authority with regards to the family has the father as the head of the house, has the wife as the helper, if you will, to the father, has the children that are under the tutelage and the authority of the parents as children born into the family of God. We place ourselves in a position of being individuals that allow God to be the Father. What does that mean? Well, that means that we allow him, through his word, to decide 
what, we're, what we are going to do, how we are going to live, how we are going to proceed, how our life will be directed. You see, God is the Father. But if God is the Father, then what are we? Well, we're brothers and sisters. You don't hear it much. Every once in a while, somebody will refer to me as brother, and that's fine. It doesn't, really, it's, it's quite pleasant. But in Matthew chapter 12, verse 50, Jesus makes a point that whoever does the will of my father the same is my brother, my sister. Like I say, we don't call each other much. We do some, but not much, brother and sister. But you used to hear that a lot, right? You used to hear everybody, you know, when they came in, well, your brother so-and-so, hello, brother so-and-so, hello, sister so-and-so, hello, brother so-and-so. And we use it more of a term now when we use it. A lot of times we use it and then we smile at people, right? Or we use it for people that we believe are a whole lot older than us. <laughs> it's more of a, of a term of respect. But from the standpoint of the Bible, the family makeup, we are brothers and sisters. What does that mean? Well, that means we're family. We're family. And while we could look at it, and it's not my plan, but but uh, if we looked at the church as the family, we are family, we understand God the Father, head of all, and us as his children, but us as a family the importance of unity, the importance of love, the importance of respect, the importance of kindness, the importance of working together. We understand that aspect of the family. And so we are brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, by the way, you know, in talking about brothers and sisters, I, I said this to three last week because of the electrical problems that we had through the electric company. Thank you, Steve, for helping us out with the electric company on that. But uh, it was a little warm in here. And I just knew, I just knew that two or three of you precious individuals were going to walk out of here and say, well, it wasn't too hot. I remember when we raised the windows and we swatted the, the, the flies and the, the wasp and we fought them in church. Well, that was probably a reality. Those were good days. And it's good if we call each other brother and sister in Christ. Don't have to. But yet at the same time, too, if we remember that relationship, role, the idea of being a family, churches today don't really think about that. Why, why does, does Paul Darty, in the role that I'm in, push the idea of getting together and eating? Because I learn more about you eating with you than I do as you're running out the door trying to see how your week's going to be. Because every time your elbow bends, your mouth flies open. And if you're not putting something in your mouth, you're telling me something about you. Why? We're family. And so the family makeup is God the Father, brothers and sisters, all resembling Jesus Christ, the Son of God. You see... We as individuals have a family resemblance. If you if you opened your Bible to First John three verse one for text a while ago, if you look in verse two, beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not been revealed what we shall be, but when but we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him. You might say, well, that seems to me that that's talking about the second coming. Well, yeah. But what does he tell us in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18? We all with open face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are changed into his image. Family resemblance. We're to look like each other. We're to look like one another. Now, when you, you ponder that aspect, isn't it interesting? We always look at our children. We always look at our babies and we say, oh, they look like so and so. We honestly have not figured grace much we look at Graceland, Suzanne and I do. We look at pictures and we say, well, she looks like the other grandfather here. And then we say, well, she looks like, you know, her mom or she looks like her daddy. And then we say, oh, she acts like them. Mm, no, no. <laughs> but, but the reality of it is, it's like 
we look at each other and we say, oh, they look like so-and-so. I was talking, Suzanne and I was talking about someone recently, and I said, well, they don't look like their parents, but they look like their brothers and sisters. Joke. There's a family resemblance. Everything worked out all right. You know, I've run people off before, but reason let us know what's going on how it's happening so there's a family resemblance and in the family our resemblance is to be like christ but we all look look alike you might say preach physically yes but spiritually remember we talked a little bit bible class this morning gave you an assignment go look at, at in the bible about the things that you and i all of us are to be spiritually and as we are to be spiritual individuals, our family resemblance is that of Christ. And so we have the family makeup of God the Father, brothers and sisters, looking like one another. But then in the family, as a child of God, we have birthmarks. You probably have a birthmark. Please don't show me yours right now. You might have a birthmark. I have a couple of them, by the way. Kind of interesting. You study them, you look them up, and you look to find out what they are. And they're really, well, there's two different kinds. But one and the most common is is the the kind of the reddish in color, and it's just a, a clump of veins really that have gathered together that are close to the surface. But these these, if you will, this birthmark, whatever yours may be, it may be brown like we made the picture there. But these birthmarks are distinguishing marks, and they're important. I often joke with twins. We've had uh, twins through different congregations we've served. The first congregation we ever served, I don't know, those good sisters were probably in their 80s, and they were twins, and they were wonderful. But I always ask twins, I always say, how do you know that you're who you are? And I say, well, what do you mean? And I say, well, how do you know that sometime in your young age, your mama didn't give you your sister's name? Well, I don't. Well, me neither. <laughs> I just love to play with people's minds. But, you know, most of them will say, well, you know, I had this tendency or I had this eye that was a little above other or, or ear that was big. My ears were bigger or smaller. My nose was smaller. But I had this birthmark. I've had, to, you know, some say, well, I have this birthmark. My sister or brother has this other one. And so we were able to, mom was able to tell the difference. Well, thank goodness. But birthmarks are just that. They're marks wherein they really can distinguish a person from another one. What are some of the birthmarks that we have as far as, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm a little dry tonight, as being children of God, being God's children, birthmarks in God's family? Well, look, first of all, at the idea of the practice of righteousness. Look at 1 John chapter 2, if you're there. Look in verse 29. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is what? Is born of him. Now, didn't that first thing we said? We're born in the family. One of the birthmarks, the earmarks, if you will, of family is that you practice righteousness. You practice doing what God has told you to do. You practice living the way God would have you to live. If we know that he is righteous, then what are we to be? Well, John says we're to be righteous as well. If we know that he's doing what's right, then what are we to do? What's right? That's part of that family resemblance. As part of, of what God has called us to do. And so one of our birthmarks is practice what you've been told to practice. Live the life that you've been instructed to live. Follow God's will. But then second birthmark is to love God and to love others. John, in 1 John, reminds us, especially if you flip over there to the fourth chapter, he reminds us a lot about love, doesn't he? He reminds us in the seventh chapter, or seventh verse, excuse me, to love one another. He reminds us in the sixteenth verse that God is love, and God loves us. And so, in that beautiful ver uh, chapter there of the fourth chapter of First John, John reminds us that here's part of the birthmarks: love God, number one, 
Well, that makes sense, doesn't it? That's what God has told us to do, love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our, all of our mind. Part of the scheme, part of, of Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, Lord our God is one. Here's what you're supposed to do. Here's the expectation. Love God. Why? He's your father. He's the one's in charge. He's the one. That's the head of the family. He's the one that you of the family that you've been born into. Love him and love him with all of your being. But not just love God, but love others. You see, it's not, it's interesting. The Bible depicts our love as love for God and love for others, and of course, love of self, but love for others. Oh, no man nothing, Paul would write to the church at Rome in Romans chapter 13 and verse 8, but to love one another. Why should we love one another? Because, Paul says, love is fulfillment of the law. Love is a fulfillment of what God expects of you. Now, he's talking about the whole law there, but love is fulfillment of what God expects. Love one another. Well, you know, some folks aren't like me, God. Some folks don't like what I like. Some folks have a, a different disposition than, than what I have. Some folks are, are, are just hard to get along with. Some, some folks, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a Southerner and, and, you know, we're different. In, in my tryouts, you know, back four years ago when I was trying to find a place, Suzanne and I went to a place in East Tennessee, lovely congregation, lovely part of the, the world. And we sitting there, I was sitting there interviewing with the elders. And one of the elders said, uh, this is an area of mountain people. Yes, sir. And mountain people are different. And I said, okay. And he said, uh, well, what are you going to do with them? And I said, I'm going to love them to death. I'll be honest. They did not like that answer. I don't know what answer I would have. I don't know what I'd have given them because it was truthful. And we would have gotten along just fine. I did notice that recently they've lost their preacher. Uh, he's gone somewhere else. That might explain a few things. But nevertheless, it's important that we love. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, that you have love one for another. John 13, verse 35. So what's the key? Well, the key is to understand that there at times there's going to be differences. Not everybody's going to be like us. Not everybody's going to think like us. Not everybody's going to reason like us. Not everybody is going to have the same attainment from a standpoint of education and, and what we retained in all of that education. But the key is, as part of the family, we love one another. We stick with one another. Have you seen families that they got along? They got along all right. They loved one another. But every once in a while, they'd fuss and fight. But now you let somebody else that wasn't part of the family come and you let them get in the fuss and fight. And all of a sudden, they gang up on the individual that's come in that's not a family member, right? Why? Because they're not a family member. I'm not saying we gang up on people, but I am saying that we love one another. And that's part of the birthmarks of being a child of God. But then we overcome the world. First John chapter 5, verse 4, this is victory that overcomes, or this is victory that overcomes the world, our faith. Part of the birthmarks of being part of God's family is to overcome the world. Well, how are we going to do that? With God's help. With God's help. You and I can't fight that fight alone. <laughs> Excuse me. When we were soldiers, we talked about here two, three weeks ago, we talked about being soldiers in, in being in the army of God and being soldiers that fight the good fight of faith. We understand that we needed Captain God to lead us through. Well, that's very true. We need God. But God will help us overcome the world. All that's in the world, John reminds us in that often used verse of 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, all that's in the world is not of God. Well, if it's not of God, then who's it of? 
Satan. And if it's of Satan, what should we want to do with it? Not a thing. We don't want any part of that. We don't want to be involved in that. That's not part of, uh, of our life and the way we want to live our life, and that's not the choices we want to make. And so we overcome the world. But then also the birthmark is to become the devil. If you're there in First John, if you look in chapter 5, verse 18, it says, we know that whoever is born of God does what? Does not sin. Oh. Preacher, I've become a child of God. I don't sin. Many, 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 many years ago, Suzanne and I were, was on vacation. And I, I, don't, I can't remember. I was trying to think this week. I can't remember if it was Phil Donahue or Oprah. I think it was Phil Donahue that was on. We had it on while we were getting ready to go wherever we were going to go for the day. <laughs> and if I'm not mistaken, this is a long time ago. This is back before this. This was B.E. This was before Ethan, so that was a long time ago. And anyway, Phil was on, and this woman was sitting there, and he was interviewing her, and I was kind of interested in it. And, I, and she made the statement, sort of had a religious tip to it, and she made this statement, I do not sin. Well, I perked up there and watched watch the rest of it. Yeah, we do. We all do. But in our fight to overcome the world, we're fighting to overcome the devil. We don't want any part of the devil. We don't want to be his servants. We don't want to be servants in his kingdom. We want to be in the family of God. In the family of God, we're told that we can overcome. We will sin, but we do not practice sin. And so John is reminding us as children of God, we don't practice sin. Well, in the family of God, we understand that there's family favor. In other words, did you, ever, did you ever ask your family growing up, or better yet, did you make this statement? I wish I was never born in this family. We probably all did. You know, that was especially when, when mom and dad were disciplining us. You know, I wish I wasn't part of this family. Wish I didn't have to do this. Well, what are what are the family favors, right quick? Well, there's prayer. Jesus would make the statement in John 15, 7. If you abide in me, whatsoever you ask, you receive, I'll give you. One of the great favors, one of the great blessings, and we've called it favors, but you could call it blessings is that being a child of God, we're able to go ask the Father for what we need. What does a child do? A child goes to a father, a child says, I want this, or I need this, or I, I, I could use that. Or this. What it is, whether it's clothes or school supplies or, or just some toy to pass the time of day or whatever it is. As child of God, as children of God, we have the wonderful wonderful avenue of casting all our care upon him because he cares for us and in casting our cares we're able to talk to him say here's what we need here's what we desire here's what we want we have the protection of god we have that protection that he's able as we've already talked about, he's able to help us overcome Satan. He's able to help us. He's able to deliver us from the midst of our temptation. The protection that God gives. There is the protection in life from the standpoint of life itself and protection from Satan and the temptation that he offers. The blessing of that protection that is not there for those that are not children in God's family. There's the provision. Provision are simply that those daily things that we need. In Matthew chapter 6, <clears throat> in Sermon on the Mount, Jesus addresses the subject of worry. Anxiety, we call it now, beginning in verse 25. We preach those sermons as preachers out of the, that text on worry, and, and so well we should and could and can. But when you look really at the verses, what are they dealing with? They're dealing with a God that's going to take care of you and going. 
Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit to your stature? Well, nobody. Behold the, the grass of the field. What does it do? Well, it's cut down, it's cast in the fire. What about your arraignment? Solomon was not, he, you've got better than, than the flowers, better than, than the beauty of the earth. God, God. And so we understand that part of the favor of the family is provisions that God provides for us. And ultimately then the providence that all things do work together for good, that God gives us those things that we need, that it all works out, that it all comes out to our good. For God is great, as he was proclaimed in 1 Chronicles 29 and verse 12, 11 and 12, actually. The greatness of God, the greatness of God is seen in that he provides for his children. He makes sure that his children are cared for, yes, but they make sure that it all works together for good. Now, as we've said so many times before, and Lord willing, we'll say so many times now, it doesn't always mean everything is what we want it to be, but at the same time, too, to think and realize that God is providing for us and God is watching over us and that God will make sure that it will all come out in the end is a promise that we need to, to if you will, nail our hats on. We need to understand that that is one of the great blessings of being part of God's family. Being his child is what he gives us. And so isn't it wonderful when we think about it to be part of God's family? to be children of God, for we are his children. And being his children, we look like him, we listen to him, and we act like he would have us to act because he will provide for us as his children. And so this evening, if you're not his child or you need to rededicate your life, won't you come while together we stand and sing?